All right, folks, here it is before your very eyes. Behold, the number 13 ball perfect mason antique jar. This elusive, rare, extremely valuable, hard to find jar has one of the most unique stories behind it. As the story goes, during Prohibition from 1920 to 1933, moonshiners who used mason fruit jars to put their moonshine in and sell were very superstitious of the number 13 jar. As such, what they tended to do was destroy them because they considered them unlucky. They would smash them or throw them away, dispose of them, because it was unlucky and they didn't want their moonshine to be unlucky. Not only that, I've heard that it wasn't just moonshine individuals, it was also witches. I've heard the story that witches as well would take these number 13 jars and they would dispose of them or destroy them because they, is, they didn't like the number 13 because of the superstition. They didn't want bad luck in any way. Now, because of the story, right, we, we know or we, it's believed that there are less number 13 jars available, making it unique, making it rare, make it, making it harder to find. Personally, as a collector, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and ask me if I have a number 13 jar. And they've reached out to me. They've called me. They've texted me. They've reached out to me on Facebook. I just know that there's a lot of people looking for this jar. But the question I have for us today is, if this jar is so rare, it's so unique, and it's so hard to find, why are they for sale all over the internet? Everywhere from eBay to Etsy to Facebook Market to Craigslist has these jars listed for extremely high prices, $20 and up, sometimes $100 to buy one of these jars. Even the lids, I've seen these, these lids here, right? Sometimes they'll have a mold number on the inside, a number 13, and people will sell the lids as the lucky number 13 lid. But the question is, again, why? If they're, if they're so hard to find and they're so valuable, why are they for sale everywhere? The truth is, and the real point of this video, is to explain to you that it's a bunch of bullshit. It's a lie. This story is not true and it is in fact a myth. It's a myth and it's a story that antique vendors and flea market vendors use to up the prices on their jars and get more money. Now, anyone who is anyone in the jar collector community knows this. They know that these jars are not rare, they're not hard to find, and they're abundantly available. available. Personally, I'm a serious collector. I own hundreds of jars, lots of very rare, unique jars, unlike this number 13 jar. And I could now while I may not be the most the utmost expert in the jar collecting world, I do know a lot of those collectors. I've met them face to face, I've spoken to them. I've read their blogs, I've read their comments online, and the consensus is that this jar is not rare. And that the moonshiner story, the witch story, whatever version of this myth has been told is a lie. And that's what I want to make very clear today. In fact, the myth is so widespread that the Ministrista Museum at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, Ball State being named after the Ball Brothers and the Ball Company, has gone to great lengths on their own website to put this myth to rest in a sense. They have gone ahead and explained pretty much the same thing I've told you today. And if we're going to look to an expert, I think that the Ministrista Museum, which is essentially the Ball Mason Jar Museum, has a lot of validity in what they say. So aside from my main point today, which is to explain to you the unimportance and lack of rarity when it comes to this particular jar, I do want to take a little bit of time to educate those looking to learn more about jar collecting and specifically ball jars. So all of these jars we have here are ball jars. 
They come from different years. They're different designs. They have different embossing on the front. Essentially, the mold writing on the front is, is different and comes in variations. From left to right, we have our oldest jars from 1885 to 1886, all the way up to the present day embossing on most of the, the ball jars, which is around 1960 until today. What I'd like to do is walk through each one of these jars and talk a little bit about the designs, talk about what makes them unique, talk about the values of the jars as well. We'll start here on the left with two of the designs from the 1800s. These aren't the only designs, uh, particularly I don't have the Buffalo Mason jar here, but these are two of the common designs and they're distinct from the other jars that we have up here and that they have a ground lip. So here you can see that the lip of the jar is not smooth. It's very ground. It almost looks like, you know, someone roughed it up and ruined the jar, but this is actually how they were made. Uh, when they were done blowing the jar, they would grind off the excess glass to allow the, the cap or the lid to fit. They're also unique, these two jars and some of the other jars in that they're shoulder mason jars. So you can see they have a shoulder. And what that means is that the cap or the lid would, when it was fit tightly, it would actually sit on the shoulder of the jar, which is what we call it shoulder mason. Both of these fall into that category. These two have unique embossing on them. They're both a little weak, sorry for not being better jars, but this is what I have right now. So we have the ball, you can see here was one of their designs, Mason Pat, November 30th, 1858. And that was the patent date, not necessarily the date the jar was made. You'll see a lot of jars that say 1858. That doesn't mean they were actually made in 1858, although this one comes close. Here's another one. Uh, this one just says ball with the underscore here. Mason's Patent, 1858. Both of these jars are the rarest, I would say, out of this bunch. However, just because they're really old, just because they're not super common, doesn't mean they're extremely valuable. You know, you'll go into antique stores and you'll see people who will try to sell these for hundreds of dollars, hoping to get some money for them. But the reality is they're not worth that. None of these jars are that expensive. These are rather common jars compared to the other jars in the jar community that you can collect. I would say, a uh, rough guesstimating here, you should expect to pay anywhere from, you know, 15 to $40, maybe $50, depending on the color, depending on the quality of the jar. Does it have cracks? Does it have chips? Uh, is it, does it have staining in it? What's the color of it? What's the embossing like? Those are all things that you have to consider when you're talking about the value. Are there bubbles in it? Are the bubbles open? Are the bubbles just small? All of that is gonna matter when it comes to the condition of a jar. So these are the older ones. And I would say the two most valuable here in this group. Next, we have our approximately 1900 to 1910 jar, which is also a shoulder mason, but this time we can see this one has a smooth lip which means they uh, moved into machine production, which is what, what we have the, the smooth lip here. And on this one, you can see it's blown on the bottom. Instead of a mold number, it's got an X and a one. You can still see the mold lines along it. But this is what we call the 3L jar. So that underscore loop looks like a third L. And that's the easy way to find a 1900 to 1910 jar. Value on this jar, I wouldn't spend 10, over $10 for a jar like this unless it's you know a unique color. Um, that would certainly increase the value, but most of your jars are gonna be about 10 to $12, even though they're valued less at about eight, that you'll find them for 10 to 12 in stores. Don't pay any more than that. Our next two jars are the same period as far as the embossing is concerned. So you can see that the embossing is really close. There, they've got that dropped A here. Let's see if I can poke at it. The dropped A here. 
they both don't they both have just the two l's and the strong underscore that kind of comes to an arrow point this one obviously says mason this one says perfect mason this one looks like it was hand blown this one was machined right you don't have that little blown hole here this one has a 4f on it mold number this one's got a three underscore not a 13. <clears throat> so they're rather similar but we can notice some differences here in that this one has got a shoulder mason right like we talked about they're both smooth lipped this one has a bead neck and so the difference is is down the road as you got into more modern jars they stopped using shoulders and they move to what are called bead necks and that means that the lid or the cap rests on the bead itself and no longer on the shoulder of the jar. And all of these, uh, most of these, except for the newer one, will take the same type of zinc lid cap. So approximately 1910 to 1923. This one being older, you would expect to pay a little more for it. You know, like I said, in the eight to 15 range, you wouldn't go any higher unless you got into a really rare color like an amber or a sky blue or a cobalt or, you know, maybe a swirl color of like green and amber. Those you'd expect to pay a lot of money. But this specific jar, 8 to 15. This one, I'd say you wouldn't want to pay any more than $5. They're valued at probably, I don't know, two to five bucks, somewhere in that range. Now we go over to our 1923 to 1933, very similar to our last jar, except this one no longer has the dropped A and it doesn't have the underscore coming all the way across. It's still perfect Mason. It's still machined. This is our 13 jar, right? Not, not valuable just because it's got a mold number on it. This is 13. Bead neck, smooth lip, very similar. You know, that two to $5 range, don't pay any more. And then we come over to our 1933 to, you know, 1962 embossing. Very similar to the 1910 to 1923, except we don't have a dropped A. We still have an underscore, perfect mason, bead neck, smooth lip, machine uh, base. Same thing, you know, no more than five bucks for a jar like this. And then finally, we come to what would be our really modern embossing, which is rather similar to the 1933 to 1962, right? It's got the 2L, the strong underscore, although the underscore doesn't quite come to a point and our B doesn't loop around like it does on the other one. So it's slightly different, wide mouth, machine manufacturer. And then we obviously we move into our 10 type of lids and closures all right smooth lip so this is very distinct our newer jars um so this is this is a rough picture of your ball jars your varieties your embossings um your designs again i don't i don't pretend to be the utmost expert into this i know quite a bit and uh i i do well collecting and i know what to look for and i hope that this video has been informational and it, and I hope it's helped you and I hope it motivates you to go out and look for the right jars. You know, you want to move towards this side of the spectrum. If you really want to collect something a little nicer then you know, your more modern jars that are much less valuable. Um, I, I just want to mention that, you know, a lot of this knowledge has come from jar collector colleagues, uh, online resources, books, uh, I give credit to all the people who have enlightened me and given me knowledge uh, when it comes to collecting jars. And I hope that I have done the same for, for some of you. Please like my video and have a great day.